Well, hey there. Thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. Now, I know you're watching this video because you want to see how to make these pyramid top caps that you saw in the video thumbnail. But first, I need to tell you a story about my great uncle who got his family through the Great Depression by making these caps by hand in his shop to earn a little extra money to get by. And those were times when only those people with a good deal of get up and go were able to support their families. I can just imagine seeing my great uncle Fred. It's the depth of the depression. It's the winter of 1933. It's bitter cold in central Michigan. And he's hard at work making plugs just like this to support his family. His hands are freezing. He's out in the shed working with classic hand tools to make these caps to put some food on the table and support his family. Well, actually, I can't imagine any of that because I just made it up. Even though there's a good deal of woodworkers and woodworking history in my family heritage, and this magnificent plow plane is part of that ha uh, heritage, preserved by my cousin Steve and gifted to me, this whole little charade was just a ruse to throw off the TikTok trolls so they'll leave us alone for the rest of the video. And as for me, I'm just going to get into it and show you how to make these pyramid cap plugs. Most of the steps for making caps of different sizes are the same. They all start out with material that's the same size as the finished cap. And you can see I've got square stock here. And this rectangular stock is six and a half by an inch and three quarters. The first machining step involves setting up a dado blade where the width of the dado blade is equal to the length of the stub tenon on the back of the cap, which in this case is 7 sixteenths of an inch. I use a forest dado king dado set, but any decent dado blade will do the job just fine. For a 7 sixteenths of an inch dado, I use the two outside blades along with an eighth inch chipper, a 1 16th inch chipper, and a 20 thousandths shim to make up the 7 sixteenths of an inch thick dado stack. Notice I'm careful to set the second blade on a thin rubber disc to protect it while I'm shuffling around parts to this dado set. And there's a YouTube moment putting the wrong blade on first. Oh boy, I probably should edit that out. And I finish the setup with a half inch zero clearance insert that's pretty close to the stack width of the dado and plenty close enough for this operation. To set the height of the dado blade, I measure the width of the mortise where the cap is going to go, which in this case is one and five sixteenths of an inch, and then carefully lay that out in the thickness of the piece I'll be making the caps from, which in this case is an inch and three quarters. Then, with an inch and five sixteenths centered up on the thickness of the piece, I can set the dado blade to the height of either of these two side marks. And it's the dado blade height setting that determines how loose or how tight these caps will fit in their mortises. And I'll point out here that this dado blade setup is about half the magic to getting good, consistent, accurate results on these pyramid caps. So take your time and dial that in and get it right. Once I'm happy with the setup of the dado blade, I'll start out by setting the rip fence to a quarter of an inch, and that'll make sense here shortly. Now that the blade and the fence are set up, I'll cut a dado ring around the end of this piece. Just as simple as that. And for all of you out there screaming at your computer screen saying, that guy's an idiot because he's wearing gloves and using a table saw, well, here it is back at you. In this application, I'm using these Smurf gloves. They're sticky, and I'm using them for grip, not to prevent splinters. And my hands aren't near that blade, are they? If I don't use gloves and the piece slips, I can spoil the piece and have a fracas. If I use gloves, I'm able to hold this piece firmly and securely for the many dozens of dados that I need to make in this operation. So don't get your undies in a bunch. And if you're not comfortable wearing gloves in an application like this, then by all means, don't do it. But don't go posting lame comments because somebody violated a rule and wears gloves while using a table saw. So now, with that rant out of the way, I'll move the fence over one and a quarter inches and repeat this dado process with a fence setting of one and a half inches. And here's what it looks like after that step. 
It's important to note that based on the shape and angles and design of this plug, the space in between those dados is enough for the top half of the plug. If I used a steeper angle on the top of the cap or used a wider shoulder on the sides, I'd need more space in between the dados because this lug right here is where the top part of the pyramid cap gets cut out of. But as it is, moving the fence an inch and a quarter at a time leaves enough space in between the dados that I can cut a complete plug in between. What you'll see in a minute is the second half of the magic for making these pyramid caps. Using a dado blade in any application can be a little spooky because it's making such a big cut. So if you're uncomfortable uh, dadoing the edges of a tall piece like this, you can always substitute a taller uh, fence on your miter guide and that'll help make those cuts with a little more confidence. And there's absolutely no shame in being safe for a job like this. Naturally, on a long piece like this, it's more efficient to start on each end and work your way towards the middle because it cuts the number of time you need to adjust the fence in half. And I should have followed my own advice when I started dadoing this piece for the video. And I continue cutting dado rings around this board over its entire length. And I think that's enough to give you a good idea of what needs to happen at this stage of making these caps. In case you're not aware, Using a miter guide and a rip fence at the same time can cause potential kickback issues. So if you're uncomfortable using the setup I'm showing here, take extra measures to ensure your safety and comfort. Because as it is, there's no pyramid cap in the world that's worth risk of a finger injury from the process of making it. As for me, once the fence has moved far enough that I can switch the miter guide to the opposite side of the blade between the fence and the blade, I do that because it keeps the workpiece a little more stable and increases my safety comfort level as I finish making the last few dados on this long piece. Cutting all these dados is enough to make a guy hungry and I'd like to stop for a break and have a piece of shepherd's pie, but the only thing on the menu right now is humble pie because I neglected an important step in making the setup for cutting these dados. I want a snug fit on the dados and I measured the mortise at an inch and five sixteenths. But after finishing up all these cuts, I thought I better double check my work. And lo and behold, the core measurement of this blank is almost an inch and seven sixteenths, which as you can see, is gonna to be too wide for a snug fit in the mortises. And instead of a snug fit, I'd end up with a no fit for the depth of these dados. With Chip working away over there to correct my oversight, I'll ask viewers to consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. It's free, you know, and you'll be notified anytime a new video is uploaded to the channel. And you can be one of the first to see when I make a mistake and somebody has to fix it. So I appreciate that. And while you're at it, hit the thumbs up button gently if you would to show YouTube that there's stuff going on here at Next Level Carpentry. I also want to point out that there's a link to an Amazon Influencers page in the video description that includes tools and supplies you see uh, me using here for this video if you need something and you can't find it locally. I need to point out that Amazon pays small ad fees for products purchased through those links, although those products are the same low online cost that you expect. There's also a link in the video description to Teespring for t-shirts and swag from the shop, a discount for Next Level Carpentry viewers for Starbond glue products that I use almost every day when I'm out in the shop for one thing or another. And there's also a link to Patreon for anybody that's interested in going above and beyond to support video production here on the channel. And to show my appreciation for those patrons who go above and beyond to support the channel, I produce a patron-only video about once a week that shows behind-the-scenes stuff from projects you see going on here in the shop, like these bunk beds and the upcoming roller stand build video. So if anyone's motivated to join that above and beyond group, just follow that link to Patreon in the video description. And now that Chip's done fixing my mistake and taking off for the day, I'm gonna get back to work, finally. Well, now that that little ordeal is over with, I can switch the dado blade out for a thin kerf blade for the second half of the magic of cutting out pyramid cap plugs out of this blank. Since it's a cross-cutting operation, normally I would go with a cross-cut blade, but because I want a little rougher texture on the tops of these pyramid plugs, I'm going to switch to a thin kerf rip blade to get a little rougher texture on the cuts. 
If you're making pyramid caps for a piece of furniture and want a smoother cut, you'll want to switch to a thin curve cross cut blade for this cutting operation. Notice that I put the outer blade on a thin rubber disc to protect its teeth while I remove and store the rest of the pieces from the dado stack set. That keeps me from chipping any teeth in the process and allows me to put the inner blade in the holder first and the outer blade second so it's stored in reverse order for when I install it next time. Also notice that I'm not using a blade stabilizer for this rip blade as I normally do because again I'd like a little rougher cut on these caps for this project. And I also switched to a standard throw plate so I can angle the blade for making the bevel cuts in the next operation. Now that I've switched back to that thin curve rip blade, it's time for the third half of the magic of making these pyramid top wooden caps, which is to set the blade's angle to make the bevel cuts on the top. And for these plugs, I chose 15 degrees. And ironically, there's nothing really magic about the angle I chose for the bevel on these caps because it's entirely a matter of aesthetics. And I felt 15 degrees was a happy medium so that the bevel shows up, but it's not so much that it looks gaudy or cheesy, in my opinion. To set up for making the beveled cuts on the top of these caps, I tilt the blade to a 15 degree angle and then set the blade height to half the width of the cap. Because my table saw is a 1982 vintage right tilt Rockwell Delta Unisaw, I've got to switch the rip fence to the opposite side for making these cuts. But anyone with a modern left tilt saw will already be set up for making this cut. And believe it or not, this quick change feature of the Rockwell Delta Unifence was a pretty novel feature back in 1982 when I bought this saw. Even though it's commonplace and even expected in this day and age. The next step in this setup is to adjust the rip fence to set the shoulder height of the caps. And for the aesthetics of these caps, I chose a half an inch. To make adjusting the fence quick, easy, and accurate, I first trim off the lugs on each end of the workpiece so they're perfectly flush with the dados cut on the ends. Then I use a Papermate Sharp Writer pencil and a rule to put a fine mark at exactly half inch over from the remaining side of the dado. Then I line up a sawtooth precisely at that mark right at the table saw surface. And this kind of move creates a lot less anxiety for those who have saw stop technology in their table saws. And now for the last step of this setup, I slide a miter guide into the miter guide slot and attach a sacrificial auxiliary fence for making these bevel cuts. This auxiliary fence is set close to the rip fence for pushing the workpiece and it's just tall enough to support the workpiece while making the cuts with the workpiece standing on edge. And now boys and girls, it's showtime. With everything set up, it's quick, easy, accurate, and safe to make the beveled cuts on each of these caps. It's important to note that I make the beveled cuts on the edges first before laying the workpiece down and making beveled cuts on each of the faces. Also note that I'm using a coarse rubber push block while making the final cut to carry the cap beyond the blade as the cut is complete and it's released from the workpiece. And there it is then, the first two of about 20 of these bevel top wooden caps for plugging mortises on those posts. Yep, the magic trick is out of the bag, but there's a couple more things that you'd probably find helpful if you get into making a batch of these plugs. The first thing for making a batch of these plugs is no surprise really, but I take the workpiece back to the miter saw and trim off the sprue on each end of the piece to clean up the lug on the underside of the cap. And with this trimming step, you can see why it was important to set the width of the dado blade to the exact length of the lug on the underside of the caps. Because as long as I'm careful trimming the sprue off the ends of the workpiece flush with the edge of the dado, the length of the lug will be equal on every cap. You can also see by the way the sprue disintegrates as I cut it off the end of the workpiece and by marks from the bevel cuts on the end of the piece that the lugs between the dados were barely wide enough for making these caps with a half inch shoulder and a 15 degree bevel cut on the top. But as they say, it's better to be lucky than good. So I go back to the table saw and cut another cap off each end of this workpiece. The nature of this rough saw and cedar means that each mortise varies just slightly in width. And I want a snug fit on these caps. So I gauge the fit and then use a best block for demanding sanding to bevel and trim the lug on the underside of the cap so that I get a nice, clean, snug fit. And it takes just a few licks with a 60 degree belt on one of those blocks to adjust the lug for a nice snug fit of the cap and the mortise. 
In this close-up shot, you can see the difference in texture of the bevel cuts, where I used the rip blade with no stabilizer for the cuts on the block on the right, where I made the block on the left earlier with a cross-cut blade using a stabilizer, which made the cut noticeably smoother, which would be nice for furniture projects, but not so much on this rough sawn timber bunk bed build. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, cutting plugs of different sizes and shapes is pretty much the same, with one exception being plugs that are perfectly square or very close to it. And the main difference is the blade height setting. If you recall from earlier, I stressed that it's important to cut the edges of rectangular pieces first and then cut the faces afterwards. And the reason that is, is so that the block isn't cut loose from the blank prematurely. And on a rectangular piece, it's only the fourth cut that releases the block. But on a square piece, the third cut will release the block from the blank and then it kind of gets jammed up in the blade. So the only thing you need to do to prevent that little situation is to lower the height of the blade so that it's just slightly below the center of the thickness of the material you're cutting. And as you'll see, it doesn't take much to make that happen. I've already gone through all the same gears preparing these square blanks that I did for preparing the blanks for these rectangular caps. So now with that slight blade height adjustment made, I can proceed to cut square caps off the end of these blanks in the same manner as before. And the only real difference in the cutting sequence for square plugs versus rectangular ones is that after I've made the fourth cut, I simply tap the cap to snap the little piece of sprue left at the very apex of the pyramid to free up the cap from the workpiece. And if a cutoff cap releases prematurely and causes problems, because the wood is fragile, I can always lower the blade just a skosh to make sure the sprue holds it in place as it comes past the blade on the fourth cut. I made all the caps for this bunk bed project out of end grain because they're made to mimic the ends of through tenons and the ends of pegs driven to hold mortise and tenon joinery together. But they can be made just as easily out of face grain if you're using them for a decorative element on some other type of project. The only real difference between the two is orientation of the grain in the blank so that the caps are cut off the face grain instead of the end grain in one style compared to the other. Here I'm cutting one face grain cap off of this chunk of carry wood that I had laying around the shop. Naturally, if I were making a batch of these plugs, I'd glue up a number of blocks like this to make a wider workpiece and successively cut caps off the ends like I did while making all the other caps in this video. Unfortunately, this block of scrap is a bit too small for me to cut off a second block safely and within my comfort zone. But at least you've seen how this process can be adapted for cutting plugs with face grain rather than end grain. Even though I see a good deal of pyramid cap cutting in the crystal ball of my future, I've pretty much reached the bottom of my bag of tricks showing you how to make these. And I hope you find those tips useful for making plugs like this in similar projects or uh, unique ones. I do want to point out though that there's a distinction between this type of plug with a stub tenon on the back of it and a typical pyramid cap plug that doesn't have that tenon and those plugs are designed to just drive into a square hole. If that's something you're interested in, there's a link here to a video that I did some time back for making regular pyramid cap plugs, the type without that tenon on them. So the process is a little bit different, but I think you'll see if you check out that video that it's easy to make them by the dozen or by the hundred using that process sequence and a few pro tips included in the video. As it is, I'm gonna get back to making sawdust, cutting pyramid caps off of these blanks and tell you, as always, and until next time, Thanks for watching. Well, hey there. I'm glad to see that you decided to stick around because I wanted to give a special shout out to 11 people that are pretty much re responsible for me doing this pyramid cap video in the first place. And the list of 11 starts with uh, Henry Cortez, who posted a comment in the recent video here, where I showed Mission Impossible or Mission Possible for drilling round holes through long boards. And uh, Henry Cortez commented on that video, hey, I love it. I'd sure like to see how you made the pyramid caps uh, that got a little bit of a cameo in the end of that video. So I posted a response that said, if uh, 10 viewers um, agree with Henry and want to see how to make these caps, I'll do a video for it. Well, as it turns out, uh, over, I don't know, five days, maybe a short week, uh, 10 people did, expressed interest in, 
in seeing how these caps were made. And I want to give a shout out to them. Um, the first one uh, to jump on that little bandwagon was Ross Curtis. Thank you, Ross. Uh, Michael Torres was next. Mega Tro Cool from Belgium. Belgium <laughs> uh, got on the uh, list, and I, I thank you guys. Uh, Patrick Bach, uh, the biker surgeon, whoever you are. Charles Walls, Bear Lemke, E. Negron, somebody with the channel titled, uh-oh, was number nine. And uh, the tenth one in that sequence was Oz Tracker. So um, every, all the other viewers can thank those 11 folks for kind of making this happen and being the inspiration for it. Uh, I'm deep into that bunk bed build and uh, didn't really plan on doing this video, but I appreciate audience participation. Uh, obviously, I can't always uh, grant video requests like this, but in this case, it just worked out, stars aligned, and um, that is the genesis of this video. So thank you guys. Everybody else want to thank them? Go right ahead. And here's another little tidbit for dedicated end of the end of the end video viewers. To replicate the rough sawn texture on some of the square pyramid caps, I decided to pre-texture them in the vise using the sharp big box handsaw technique that featured at the end of the end of the end of the Mission Impossible Long Holes video. A few quick licks with that handsaw removes the smooth plain surface on the side of the blanks and gives some interest with aged weathered abuse to the sharp corners of the blank so that these pyramid caps come out with a unique texture all their own. And I'll sign out for good this time so I can finish up making the caps for that bunk bed project. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the end. Next level carpentry, out.